Hypothesis. All lessons on mathematical proofs are boring. Conclusion. This lesson's going to be boring. If you've been comfortable with the logic that we've been doing over the past couple of lessons, you'll be comfortable whenever it comes to mathematical proofs. Sure, they can be confusing, but the logic behind them is straightforward. The, pro the process of getting from a hypothesis to a conclusion it's logical. Now what we've done up to this point is we have come up with some generic elements, you know, our P's, our Q's, our R's, our S's, the propositions, right? And then we've also created some definitions. Think about it this way, our AND. When we told you what an AND was, it was a definition. We said, I've got two propositions, I'm going to make a compound proposition by ANDing them together. And the definition said, if both of the propositions are true, then the compound proposition is also going to be true, false otherwise. That was a definition. And then we proved some theorems after that. We came up with that idea of, oh, I don't know, how about De Morgan's theorem? De Morgan's theorem said that if I, if I negate the and of two propositions, that's the same as oring a negation of one proposition with the negation of the other proposition. That wasn't a definition. We had to prove that. All we're going to do is start proving more from here on out. Um, and truth tables, one of the things that's cool about truth tables is that whenever it ha when we have like three or two or three, four propositions, I can enumerate all the cases, all possible cases, which makes it so that a truth table can be used to prove a lot of things. But there are a lot of things that we'd like to prove that have an infinite number of cases. For example, if we're trying to prove something on an infinite number of integers, right? And we've got a problem if we're trying to stick with our case situation there. For example, just simply saying that 2 squared is 4 is not enough to say that the square of all integers is even. Now, if you remember working with our truth tables, you realize that we start out with a column that has all the propositions, right? And then we go from one column to the next column to the next column. And what we're doing is we're building upon what we have with the cases and applying different propositions as we go along. And that's a type of direct proof. And whenever you look at a direct proof, what you're talking about is getting from point A to point B, a direct route, right? We're not going any through any sort of, of, of bypass, right? And so what you've got are these, these things called premises, all right? And we're going from one to the next to the next and until we get to some final stage where we have defined our conclusion. We've come up with our conclusion. So premises, another word, hypotheses. So we've got P1, P2, P3, all the way to Pn. And eventually, that is enough to justify the conclusion. Now, if you look at this, it's like a chain. If you break any one of those links in the chain, then we've broken the path to our conclusion. Conclusion. And that means that P1 and P2 and P3 and all the way down to Pn have to be true. Sounds a lot like our AND operation, doesn't it? And so we've got this idea of premise built upon premise built upon premise built upon premise in order to get our conclusion. Now oftentimes this is written as P1, P2, P3, all the way down to Pn. And that idea that we've still, we've got this stack, this process that we have to get through all of these before we get to our conclusion. Typically our conclusion is identified by using those three little dots which represent therefore. Now we're going to do some proofs, but before we do any proofs, we're going to build upon some assumptions. You know, all of us have some mathematical background, and there's some ideas that hopefully we're all pretty comfortable with. For example, uh, let's assume if A and B are integers, right? Then uh, A plus B is an integer, right? Uh, and, 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 you know, 5 plus 7 is an integer. And somebody proved this long ago because there's an infinite number of integers, right? And we didn't test every single case. Then we also have A times B is an integer. All right. What else? Uh, let's see. If A is even, then there exists... <laughs> 
and this thing called there exists. It actually, there's a symbol that we use in math a lot to represent there exists, and that's a backwards E, right? Have you seen that before? So that backwards capital E uh, represents there exists. Uh, an integer k such that a is equal to 2 times k. You've probably seen this before, but the idea is that every even integer can be represented by this expression 2 times k, where k is also an integer. All right, and then we're going to also say that if a is odd, then there exists an integer k such that a equals 2 times k plus 1. And you've probably seen these before, but the idea is that I can generate any odd number with this expression. So let's do some short direct proofs here. First of all, if a is an even integer, then a squared is even. What's our p and our q here? Well, our p is this idea that a is an even integer, right? So if p, then q, a squared, is even. How are we going to perform this? Well, first of all, what we're looking at is how do you define if something is even? Remember our assumptions. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to really well define the, the starting point, the p, and we're going to really well define our ending point. So the idea is that a is an even integer, that's going to be a is equal to some k times 2, right? And a squared means that there's another k where you can have 2 times k is equal to a squared. So that's kind of our beginning and our ending point. So let's start out with a is equal to 2k for some integer k, right? And that means a squared is equal to 2k squared, which is 4k squared, which I can pull a 2 out of that 4 and get 2 times 2k squared, 2k squared, right? And what we've got here is we know k is an integer. And I showed earlier that k, that anything, any integer times another integer is an integer. So we know k squared is an integer. And then we've got an integer times an integer 2. That 2 is an integer. So inside of these parentheses, we have an integer times 2. Guess what? a squared is even. Now, how about if a is odd integer, then a squared is odd. Now, intuitively, may, intuitively, we may know this because, remember, in order for something to be even, that means that it has to have 2 as one of its factors, right? Well, if 2 is not a factor of a, then 2 is not a factor of a squared. But can we do this using a direct proof based on the assumptions that we did earlier? a is equal to 2k plus 1, a squared is equal to 2k plus 1, the quantity squared. What happens when we multiply that out? We get 4k squared plus 4k plus 1, right? And then we can take these first two terms here, pull a 2 out, that gives us 2k squared plus 2k. So we have 2 times 2k squared plus 2k, and then plus this 1. And let's go back to that definition of an odd integer. We have k is an integer, k squared must be an integer then, plus 2 plus excuse me, 2 times 2k must be an integer. And then we've got 2k also has to be an integer. An integer plus an integer is an integer. Inside the parentheses, we have an integer. So 2 times this integer plus 1, a squared must be odd. Let's do a couple more here. How about if a and b are both odd integers, then a plus b is even. That one sounds a little interesting, doesn't it? Switch from odd to even, right? Well, will it work for us? Well, if a and b are both odd, that, that means that a is equal to some there is some k such that a is equal to 2k plus 1, k being an integer, and b is equal to some 
there's some j to where there's some integer j where 2j plus 1 equals b. Let's go ahead and add these guys together. a plus b is equal to 2k plus 1 plus 2j plus 1. Through the commutative law, we can swap things around here and we can get 2j, 2k plus 2j plus 1 plus 1. This is equal to 2k plus 2j plus 2. We can pull a 2 out of that whole mess and get that a plus b is equal to 2 times that quantity k plus j plus 1. Well, any, any integer plus another integer is still an integer. Plus 1, still adding another integer, still an integer. So everything inside the parentheses is an integer. Times 2 means that a is even. So q, excuse me, p, a and b are both odd. q, a plus b is even. We've proven it. Now, a very common form of these proofs is the modus ponens. All right, the modus ponens form. Now, the modus ponens form is based on that implication, right? We've got the P implies Q. Now, what we're saying is, is if P implies Q and P is true, then we've got Q, all right? And we can do this with a truth table. You've seen the truth table before. You've got P and Q and every possible combination of true and false for P and Q. And if you remember, going back to the idea of the dessert, if you clean your plate, you'll get dessert. Well, this case right here where you cleaned your plate but didn't get dessert, that is the place where P implies Q is false. In other words, your parent did not honor the, 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 the did not honor that implication, all right? Now, if we move on and say this guy right here, and remember what I was saying was everything above the bar, you and all of those together in order to get the prime, in order to get the, to prove the conclusion, what we're saying is P implies Q and P, all right? So that's this column ended with this column. And so we've got false and true, that's false, False and true, that's false. True and false, that's false. True and true, that is true, all right? Now, the idea that P implies Q and P implies Q, well, we take this column, we, well, actually, we take this column and have it imply this column, and we have false implies false, that's true. False implies true, that is true. False implies false, that is true. True implies true, that's true. In other words, we have no place where true implied false. And so we've got proof, or <laughs> proof, so to speak, that the modus ponens form works. The problem is, is that we could have some fallacies whenever it comes to modus ponens. For example, one of the fallacies is that we could have a false premise. Think about it this way. What if I had had the premise, as silly as it sounds, all numbers are even, and then P is nine is a number, right? So all numbers are even, nine is a number, therefore nine is even, right? That's not quite right. The other problem that you might see or encounter with modus ponens is if these guys are swapped. If somebody said P implies Q, Q therefore P. You know, it looks kind of silly, like something we wouldn't do, but it's not as difficult to do, not as difficult to make this mistake as you might think. For example, what if we said, if taxes are lowered, income will rise, income rose, taxes were low, therefore taxes were lowered. You know, that's not quite the, you might have changed jobs, right? That There are a number of ways that income could have risen. So it is possible to switch those. That is a fallacy. Now we also have something called proof by contradiction. Now proof by contradiction may help us out whenever a direct proof is not possible. Think of it this way. We know the one case where P implies Q is false, right? What is that one case? Well, that one case is when P is true and Q is false, right? We know that, okay? That one case we can identify with the expression 
P and not Q, right? So we have P and not Q. If we can show that that implies not P. In other words, remember that the one case where P implies Q is false is this case right here. If we can show that that is equal to not P, then we have actually proved that P implies Q. In order to figure out that this is a logical equivalence, we're going to show that this side of the expression equals this side of the expression for all possible combinations of P and Q. So let's go ahead and draw, draw our truth table. We have P and Q and all our possible values for true and false for P and Q. So we have false, true, false, true for Q and false, false, true, true for P. Then why don't we just, while we're at it, because we're going to need not Q and not P, let's just go ahead and figure out what not P and not Q are equal to. And so not P is just the inverse of, or the negation of P, that's true, true, false, false. And then not Q is the negation of Q, true, false, true, false. All right, so what's the very first thing that we're going to do? Well, inside, on this left side of the expression, inside of the parentheses, we've got P ended with not Q. Now, P ended with not Q. That's this column right here, ended with this column right here. So the only time that we have two trues is in this third row. There's a true. Everywhere else, we have at least one false. At least one of those propositions is false. And what I want you to see is that we have identified the row where we have that fallacy, right? That, or not the fallacy, but <laughs> you were promised dinner dessert, but you didn't get it. That is in this third row. So this really is the inverse of the proposition P implies Q. But let's finish out this left side of the expression. What we want to do now is P and not Q implies not P. What does that give us? Well, what we'll see here is we'll see that anytime we're going from this column right here to imply the not P column right here. So this is false implies true. That was okay. Remember, the only one we're looking for is true implies false. False implies true. That's true. True implies false. That's false. False implies false, that's true. Doesn't it look familiar? Yeah, looks familiar, of course, because what we've got is P implies Q, that's true, true, false, true, like we've been doing. Now, let's identify this, we'll just, we'll just give it a, a character, so we'll make this guy R, and we'll make this guy S, and this last column will have R implies S, or excuse me, R if and only if S. And remember, if and only if is just looking for equality. So you've got true, true, that's true, 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 that's equal, F false, false, that's equal, true, true, that's equal. And we have our tautology, which proves that proof by contradiction is a sufficient way to prove something. So remember, we did that proof if A is an even int, then a squared is even, right? Well, proof by contradiction is saying, why don't we try and prove if a is even int, then a squared is odd int, all right? And let's just make sure we have our definitions proper up there. All right. Now, in order for this to be true, that means that A, remember A is even. So A is equal to 2K for some integer K. And we'll just simply say A squared is equal to 2J plus 1 for some integer J. Because this is the format for the odd integers and that is the format for the even integers. Can we do this? Well, let's go ahead and take A squared take from this, generate it from this line, and what we've got is 4k squared. Well, if a squared is equal to 4k squared, then it also has to equal 2j plus 1, right? Well, let's solve for j. By bringing j over here, we've got 2j is equal to 4k squared minus 1, and then we'll divide both sides by 2. We get j is equal to 2k squared minus 1 half. Now, what we've got here is 2k squared, that's an integer, right? 
minus one half, no longer an integer. So what we've got here is that j cannot be an integer if we come up with this process. So that there's so there's a contradiction. All right. What is the what is and what is another way of looking at a proof by contradiction? Well, what we're saying is is that what we've had at the end here is I asked that j be an integer and k be an integer, but that can't be that that premise can't hold true if we've got this result here, this conclusion. Therefore, one of our original premises has to be wrong. And the way we find that, all, all these steps worked, right? Nothing I did in going from step to step to step was an illegal move. Hence, what we've got is the original premise has to be incorrect. And since this original premise is incorrect, then the first premise, what we were trying to prove, is correct. Now in our previous video, video, we showed that there was such a thing as the contrapositive. And that said that P implies Q if and only if not Q implies not P. All right. Now, if you're interested in the truth table for that, it is in the previous lesson. But basically what we do is we assume Q is false. And by assuming Q is false, show that P must be false. All right, so right there. So if I do, if I assume Q is false and it implies P is false, that is equivalent to showing that P implies Q. So let's, for example, do a real quick, uh, quick um, example. Let's, for example, do a real quick example. Let's say that if a plus 1 is odd, then a is not odd, right? So if a plus 1 is odd, then a is not odd. How are we going to prove this? Well, instead of proving that if a plus 1 is odd, then a is not odd, try proving that if a is odd, then a plus 1 is not odd. All right, remember, a plus 1 is our p, so we invert that. So a plus 1 is odd, p inverted is or negated is a plus 1 is not odd. So this guy right here is not p if this is p. And then we've got q is not, a is not odd, and not q is a is odd, all right? So we'll get a is equal to 2k plus 1, right? That is our q. a is odd, right? So there's our way of, of proving that. So a plus 1 is equal to 2k plus 1 plus 1, right? All I did was simply substitute or add 1 to both sides of the expression. That means that a plus 1 is equal to 2k plus 2, which means a plus 1 is equal to 2 times k plus 1. Guess what? That means a plus 1 is even, and I've proven that if a is not odd, excuse me, if a is odd, then a plus 1 is not odd. It's kind of going backwards to prove our original premise. In the next lesson, we're going to be giving some hints as to how to get better at doing proofs and show some examples from each of the types we've covered in this lesson.